Welcome to our very first annual IRB Days. We're hoping that this is going to be an event that we can continue, um, you know, if we can get our attendance going. We think that this information is very important and very helpful for researchers, investigators, and especially coordinators. Um, so is everyone in here a coordinator? Or, yeah, yeah, no? What is your role, sir? I'm in the dissertation phase. Oh. Okay, all right, excellent. It's good to have you, thank you for coming. Um, so for those of you that are unfamiliar with me, um, my name is Courtney Romaine. I'm the Education Outreach Coordinator for the Office of Human Research. Other OHR staff today, uh, we have our director, Carly Emerson, who is sitting back here and will be peppering uh, the presentation with some comments. And if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to ask us. Also with us is Margot Kern, our IRB administrator. Margot reviews the full board studies or the greater than minimal risk protocols. Um, and finally, we have Ms. Brittany Lewis, an IRB analyst, and unfortunately, Brittany will be leaving us after today. Um, so thank you, Brittany, for coming. Uh, we really appreciate all your work that you've put in uh, to OHR over the past year and a half, and we are gonna miss you. All right, so let's get started this morning. Um, this morning we're going to talk about human subjects research regulations. So how to stay in compliance and protect human subjects. What we're going to talk about this morning is primarily um, the differences in the Office of Human Research Protections and FDA regulations. So those of you that have been doing research for a while or are familiar with research, you know that even though there is one big set of rules, how those rules are applied in different organizations and different agencies are a little bit different. We're going to identify if research is FDA regulated and what it means to do off-label research. So those of you that are working with investigators that want to use um, drugs or devices in an off-label way, we're going to examine that. We're going to review the 1572. So the 1572 is for investigational new drugs. And then we're going to review some FDA warnings, which is that uh, Form 483 that you have. We're going to do a little bit of a case study about the um, FDA warnings in Form 483. Uh, we're going to focus on one of my favorite investigators, uh, Dr. Stephen Boyce. And by favorite, I mean, wow, uh, a lot of violations there. So uh, we're also going to talk about how to prepare and for a review and any sort of monitoring or auditing. And while this is more um, FDA focused, the review and monitoring is really more of a do's and don'ts of research. So while those of you that are doing clinical research may be a little bit familiar with this, if you're not doing clinical research, sir, um, this education is really important to you as well because it does talk about how to stay in compliance with research regulations. So don't think we're leaving you out, okay? All right. So just to give you a little bit of an overview, some of the agencies that are involved in human subjects research protections, the Office for Human Research Protections, or OHARP, provides leadership in the protection of the rights, welfare, and well-being of subjects involved in research conducted or supported by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Now, although this is pertaining particularly to HHS-supported research, at GW, we actually apply any regulations that are um, applied to supported research to unsupported research. So even if your study is not funded, we're still going to use the same regulations to review your study. The Food and Drug Administration ensures that human and veterinary drugs and vaccines and other biological products and medical devices intended for human use are safe and effective. So if you are doing a clinical trial with any sort of device, drug, or biologic, or doing a um, animal study, then the FDA may come into play here. And finally, institutional review boards. An IRB is a committee established to review and approve research involving human subjects. The purpose of the IRB is to ensure that all human subjects research being conducted in accordance with all federal, institutional, and ethical guidelines. So what we do at the IRB is review the research, making sure that the regulations are being met and that our institutional policies and procedures are being adhered to. So that's just a little bit of an overview of the agencies that are involved in protecting human subjects.
So when we talk about the regulations, and you know, here is say, oh, the regs say you can't do this, or the regs say you can't do that. The federal policy for the protection of human subjects is called the common rule. And it was published in 1991 and codified in separate regulations by 15 federal departments and agencies. So the common rule is applicable to the Department of Education, DOD, uh, Department of Justice, any sort of agency that has adopted this rule. The HHS regulations, 45 CFR 46, include four subparts. So subpart A is the common rule, and this is what is applicable to all these agencies. Subpart B is additional protections for pregnant women, fetuses, and neonates. Subpart C is additional protections for prisoners. And subpart D is additional protections for children. You will hear us call these the vulnerable populations. So these are the federally regulated vulnerable populations. However, at GW and at most IRBs that I'm familiar with, they actually apply other populations that they consider to be vulnerable as well and provide additional protections for them, although they don't have their own subpart in the regulations. So each agency includes in its chapter of the Code of Federal Regulations section numbers and language that are identical to those of the HHS 45 CFR 46 subpart A. So like I said, they're all gonna be pretty much the same. There are, like I said, a little bit of differences, and so that's why I really wanna go through these OHARP and FDA regulations with you today. So the similarities and differences. So the definition of research is a little bit different. OHARP defines research as a systematic investigation designed to develop or contribute to generalizable knowledge. So it's research development, testing, and evaluation. Whereas the FDA defines research as any experiment that involves a test article and one or more human subjects, and that either must meet the requirements for prior submission to the Food and Drug Administration. Now, you'll notice a lot of times on our determination worksheet, we ask you if you are involving four or more human subjects. Because at GW, if you are just conducting research that meets the definition of OHARP, we don't necessarily consider anything under four to be generalizable knowledge. However, if you are engaged in FDA regulated research, even if it's one person, that one person doesn't matter. You have to submit to the IRB for review. Okay, so even if it's one individual. So if you are engaged in FDA regulated uh, research, that determination worksheet is not for you. Okay, just submit. When in doubt, submit. And the definition of a human subject is also a little bit different. OHARP defines a human subject as a living individual about whom an investigator conducting research obtains data through intervention or interaction or identifiable private information. So this is your retrospective document reviews, your anonymous online surveys, your interviews, anything like that when you're engaged with the individual. Whereas the FDA calls a human subject an individual who is or becomes a participant in research, either as a recipient of the test article or as a control. A subject may either be a healthy individual or a patient. So even if you have a control group and they are not engaged in any sort of research related activities beyond maybe a chart review, they are considered a human subject per the FDA. Okay. So the regulations on human subjects research. Again, we talked a little bit about OHARP and their different parts, A, B, C, and D. And these regulations provide special protections for children, pregnant women, fetuses, neonates, and prisoners. Now, the FDA has a lot of special considerations, and they break these down a little bit more. So when you're talking about FDA regulations, part 50 is the protection of human subjects. So subpart A is the definitions. Subpart B is applicable in the informed consent process. And subpart D is children. There are no additional protections required for pregnant women, fetuses and neonates, or for prisoners. So there are no subparts for those vulnerable populations. Part 54 is financial disclosure by clinical investigators. 
This is why we, and when I say we, I mean GW and the MFA will require you to complete a financial closure um, or a financial disclosure city training module because the FDA will be looking for it. Part 56 is the IRBs. Whereas OHARP incorporates that into its greater subpart A, the FDA has its own little um, part for us. Part 11 is electronic records and signatures. Part 312, investigational new drug applications. Part 809, in vitro diagnostic products for human use. And finally, part 812 are investigational device exemptions. So you note that there's a lot of different uh, subparts and a lot of different parts and rules and regulations that we have to look at for FDA regulated products. Emergency use. This is something that we've dealt with a couple of times here at GW. For OHARP, there's no special emergency IRB review procedure. So they don't consider emergency research a thing. However, the FDA does. The FDA provides exemption from prospective IRB review requirement for emergency use of a test article in specific situations. And the FDA emergency use provides procedure for IRB clearance of investigational product use when possible prior to use in an emergency clinical setting. So I'll give you an example of this. Um, let's say an individual comes into the hospital and they come in through the Department of Emergency Medicine, excuse me, the emergency department, and they come in and they have, um, you know, a traumatic brain injury and they are unconscious. There could be a couple of different issues going on here. There could be research that, or a research test article that is helpful to them that they know is going to benefit that individual, and in that case, the treating physician may provide that emergency test article to that individual knowing that it may benefit them. Another situation would be you have a clinical trial ongoing where you know that there might be an instance where an individual may be unconscious or unable to provide consent on their own. And in those situations, if you are unable to get in touch with a legally authorized representative prior to providing that test article, we may implement an emergency research um, trial. So those are very specific situations and uh, they're a little bit different. So the first situation, you give the drug and then you get a consent later, uh, you inform the IRB later on, maybe it's a new drug that uh, you're being used in an off-label way but you wanna use it for research and then you inform the IRB as soon as possible. The second situation is something that will have already gone through IRB review, gone through a lot of um, community uh, information, get input from a lot of different at-risk populations, uh, give people an opportunity to opt out if they wish to. So there's a couple of different ways that we can address emergency research with the FDA. If you are, um, you do have a participant that comes in and you think needs uh, an emergency situation, try and contact the IRB first. Um, if this happened on a weekend or outside of hours, then you are authorized to go ahead and do that. And you have to notify the IRB that five, within five days is our policy. Mm -hmm. um, so, but definitely try and contact us first because you know we'll, we can. And if you do research where you think you may have this type, so if you are in the ED or. Um, work with you know uh, infectious disease patients where maybe they would, they would come in and they would not be able to consent for themselves um, because they're so sick, something along those lines, then touch base with us beforehand and kind of prepare for this and then we can at least talk to you about what documentation you need on your end to make sure you're covering yourself as much as possible. So just to reiterate, um, Carly, what you're saying is that if the first situation happens and you do have a patient come in and they are unconscious, um, make every opportunity to reach out to the IRB, call us, we're there until five, Monday through Friday. If it does happen in the evenings or on the weekends, you need to notify us within five days of the incident. Uh, conversely, if you do anticipate that participants may come in, be unconscious, and you have to engage in emergency research, that's something that we would definitely review under a, a full committee and provide you approval for. So those are the two different situations. 
Exempt research. Um, exempt does not mean exempt from our IRB review. And I see a few of you smiling because you've heard me say that time and time again. Um, it does mean that it is exempt from the federal regulations. So DHHS exempts certain categories of research and provides for a secretarial waiver. So it means that that research doesn't have to undergo any additional regulatory review. However, the FDA provides for sponsors and sponsor investigators to request a waiver of IRB review requirements, but not informed consent requirements. There are a very limited number of categories which are exempt. So these situations would be um, research on drugs that were established, I believe, before 1976. Um, there are other INDs that you have to meet very specific criteria in order to be exempt from an IND if you're doing drug research, and we're going to talk about those uh, a little bit later on. Waiver of parental or guardian permission in minimal risk studies. For minimal risk studies involving children, the IRB may waive the requirement of consent if the research meets the criteria of 46116D or is designed for conditions or a population for which parental or guardian permission is not reasonable requirement to protect the subjects. So if we decide to waive a parental permission in a subject population such as abused or neglected children or minors that are emancipated, um, that is up to the IRB. However, waiver of parental permission is not allowed for FDA regulated research. And the reason for this is because that research will more times than not be considered greater than minimal risk Therefore, you would probably need to obtain both parental permissions. Um, however, if one parent is unavailable, um, unknown, or deceased, then in that situation, uh, one parent is acceptable. Okay. So if you're doing drug or device or biologic research and you want to enroll kids, you can't waive parental permission. Okay. Waiver of documentation of informed consent. OHARP allows for alteration of the requirement for a signed informed consent document in certain minimal risk studies. So some of you may have obtained a waiver of documentation of informed consent for some of your research. Um, this is primarily when the main risk to the study is breach of confidentiality. The FDA does not permit a waiver of documentation, so you have to get that signed consent document when you're engaged in FDA regulated research. Obtaining informed consent is deemed feasible, except in two situations, clinical emergency, which we mentioned, and also emergency research, okay? And these are outlined very clearly in the regulations. Um, so again, if you are conducting FDA-regulated research, you are not eligible for a waiver of documentation. This is one that we see uh, quite often, actually, for dating consent forms, and this is something that we're also going to talk about this afternoon in our good clinical practice session. So OHARP regulations do not explicitly require consent forms to be dated. I bet you didn't know that. Uh, we do encourage that practice, and we encourage you to get the subject to date that consent document. You also do not need to provide them with a signed copy. Um, however, again, this is something that we strongly encourage you to do. Just add to that, sorry. Um, if you're not going to have a consent date and consent form, which again, highly encourage GCP that is required, um, you should at least write a source note for yourself uh, that you can put in that participant study file that says that you did obtain documentation, the date and the time. If you don't do that and there's later, later a question about when the research activities began and when participant gave consent, if you don't have documentation of that, you can be dated on that. So make sure you are documenting it somewhere, even if it's not on the consent form. Right. So even if they do miss that date and, you know, we all have been there, those of you that have been coordinators for a while, you go through your consent forms and you go, oh my gosh, they didn't date this. Well, how do you go back and get that subject to date it? Your progress note or your source document will help back that up. So even if they don't date it, you still have that progress note indicating that they signed the consent prior to engaging in any research related activities. Um, but it's always a good idea to get them to date it. 
So the FDA requires that consent documents be dated as well as signed by the subject or the subject's LAR. Um, they do not require that the principal investigator or designee sign this document. Again, this is a practice that we strongly encourage, and I think that most of you probably do. Um, so it's just a good idea to do it to make sure that you have that additional signature on there. Again, you are not required to provide them with a, um, or for FDA, I think you are required to provide them with a signed copy, actually. And a waiver of informed consent or consent not required. For OHARP, a waiver is permitted if all the following conditions are met. So the research involves minimal risk. The waiver will not adversely affect the rights and welfare of subjects. The research could not practically be carried out without the waiver and where appropriate subjects will be provided with additional information. So that's what the IRB looks at for a waiver of consent for research that is not FDA regulated. However, for the FDA, there are very few exceptions when informed consent would be waived. So if the subject is confronted with a life-threatening situation, necessitating the use of a test article, we spoke about that earlier with emergency research, Informed consent is not possible because of an inability to communicate with or obtain legally effective informed consent from the subject. Again, an emergency research situation. However, this would be one where the IRB would probably review your study prior. Uh, no time to obtain consent from the LAR. No alternative method of approved therapy available that provides equal or greater likelihood of saving a subject's life. And the IRB approves emergency research without requiring informed consent. So these are the situations in which an FDA regulated study uh, might have a waiver of consent. Yes. So um, going back to the previous slide, you don't have to go back, but, oh. but I understand why you would give them a copy of the consent, but what's the thinking of why, why it should be signed? So the reason that we encourage them to obtain a signed copy is just for um, kind of legality purposes, because it is a promise between you and the research participant, especially if they are going to be engaging in a high risk study that involves a test article. So it just demonstrates that they have signed off on it, that they understand what the study is about, the purposes, what their requirements are, and the risks and benefits. And that way they have it for their copies as well, because who knows what could happen and, you know, maybe over the course of the research something happens to them and, and they pass away and, you know, a family member may see this document and say, what is this? You know, my, my family member didn't sign this or, or they didn't agree to be part of this research. That way they can have a signed copy for their records. Yeah. It just makes you feel good. That's <laughs> the bottom line. Okay, so now that we've gone through the differences, uh, we're going to talk about when your research is FDA regulated, because I think that this is something that we come across quite often with investigators in the IRB, and we go back and forth and saying, well, you know, are you going to be getting an IND? Why not? Do you need an IND? And this can be something that can, and I will admit to it, hold up the review of a study. Because oftentimes it's not always very cut and dry. We don't always know right away whether or not something requires an IND or an IDE or if the FDA needs to be involved. So I would really strongly encourage you to reach out to the FDA. They're not as scary as everyone seems to think. Um, I literally had an investigator sit in my office one day and ask me to call the FDA for him because he was scared to call them. I said, don't be scared. They're the FDA. They want you to call them. They want to help you. Um, so they are very responsive. It may take a couple of days, but they will get back to you. Okay, so we're going to talk about um, determining whether or not your study is FDA regulated. And then we're going to talk about off-label drug use, which I think is a big thing right now. So an FDA regulated study Regardless of whether or not you are going to have a study that is going to be used in a research manner or a drug that's going to be used in a research manner, off-label, on-label, whatever, it is actually the practice of our IRB to review all studies that involve off-label prescription drug, 
significant risk device or tobacco products under the full review. Okay, so we go to full committee for the initial review of this. At that time, the IRB may determine that your research is minimal risk and does not need to be reviewed under full committee uh, for subsequent reviews. But they are going to make that determination. So even if you submitted a study, submit an application, and you are sure that it's minimal risk and that you don't need to go through FDA, we're going to review it under full committee just to ensure that everybody is meeting the requirements that they need to meet. It doesn't mean that we are questioning you. It just means that we want to make sure that it's given a thorough overview. Okay. But all studies that involve an IND, IDE, or 510K will always undergo full committee review and remain full committee. Um, do you guys know what, a, what these acronyms mean? So IND, if you're not familiar, is an investigational new drug. IDE is investigational device exemption, uh, generally for significant risk devices or new devices. And a 510K is a device where there's already a predicate device on the market and they just want to look at a um, new version of it. It's like two different kinds of crutches, for example. Okay. So how do you know if you need an IND? Clinical investigation of a drug product that is lawfully marketed in the U.S. is exempt from the requirements of an IND if all the following apply. So all of these conditions have to be met in order for you to be exempt from an IND. So number one, the investigation is not intended to be reported to the FDA as a well-controlled study in support of a new indication or for for use nor intended to be used to support any other significant change in labeling for the drug. So if you are going to see if it works in epileptic children as well as for earaches, then that's something that would need to go to the FDA. Okay, you may need to submit an IND for that. Also, if you are going to update the labeling for it, again, you need an IND. Number two, if the drug that is undergoing investigation is lawfully marketed as a prescription drug product, the investigation is not intended to support a significant change in the advertising for the product. Again, if you're looking at an epileptic drug and want to see how it works for earaches and you want to advertise it as something that can treat earaches, then that needs to undergo FDA review and you need an IND. The investigation does not involve a route of administration or dosage level change or use in a patient population or other factor that significantly increases the risk or decreases the acceptability of the risks associated with the use of the drug product. Basically, if you're going to change the route of administration or the study population or increase or decrease the dosage levels, these are things that need to undergo review by the FDA. So any kind of change that you want to make to that. The investigation is, not conduct is conducted in compliance with the requirements for review by an IRB and the requirements for informed consent. And finally, the investigation is conducted in compliance with the requirements of 21 CFR 312.7, Promotion and Sale of Investigational Drugs. So all these conditions have to be true in order for you to be exempt from an IND. Now, I will say that there are some situations that we have come across at the IRB wherein a study drug had been approved in the U.S., uh, was no longer being used in this country, so it had received previous approval but was no longer an active drug, and it needed to be shipped in from overseas. Um, therefore, you would need an IND from the Food and Drug Administration to get that through the Customs Authority. So those are different situations that you would need an IND even if all these other conditions have been met. So there are different situations where we would require you to submit to the FDA to get an IND. Any questions about when you need an IND or don't need an IND? I would just add that if you think you are may potentially need an IND, contact FDA and also let us know right away um, as you're designing your protocol or writing your IRB application, we can meet with you and help you. And um, it's also good for us to have a heads up that way we can be on the lookout for your application and ideally expedite it um, in the time that we assign it to a review committee. So 
not expedite in review as under an expedited category, but we can try and review it quickly when it comes into the office, assign it to an agenda, because sometimes that is an issue. We get a study, we go back and forth with the investigator, do you need an IND? Um, we need very clear documentation for justification if they don't. Um, and sometimes this is especially complicated in cancer studies where they're looking at a bunch of different combinations of drugs or, um, or you know, slight dosing, but they're not planning on changing the labeling that's based for a sp uh, specific patient maybe. Um, and so it, it's very helpful for us to talk through that with you ahead of time. That way when it comes in, we're familiar with it and ideally we can assign it to a panel right away to get review and it doesn't sit with us for a little while. So if you do anticipate that your study may need an IND or even if you're not sure, it's always a good idea to reach out to the FDA to get that in writing first and to contact us just to, you know, see what's going on. Make sure that we know what's happening. That way, if you do need an IND, we're not spending a lot of time during the pre-review process going back and forth, which is going to hold up your final review, and we can get it on for a committee as soon as possible. So we can really sort of uh, push it through the, the queue, so to speak. Okay, so it's better for us to know what's happening right away than to get a submission in and then wonder what's going on, whether or not you've gone through the appropriate steps, and because that can really hold up your review, and we don't want that. Okay. So when we talk about a minimal risk drug or device trial, generally a study may be determined to be minimal risk and reviewed under expedited procedures during initial review for the following situations. A drug is used on label or devices are employed in an on label manner and other studies uh, that meet the criteria of expedited categories one or four at initial review. So those of you that are not familiar, um, expedited category one is drugs or devices that are used uh, for their intended marketed use and category four is um, collection of data through non-invasive means such as MRIs, EEGs, ECGs, et cetera. Um, so if you are looking at something like Tylenol and you wanna look at the effects of Tylenol taken immediately after exercise, and then you're going to measure someone's, you know, heart rate and, you know, blood pressure, and you're going to, uh, you know, use some other sensors, that is definitely a minimal risk study uh, that we would not consider to go to full committee. So again, I went through expedited category one and four. I realize that this font is very small, um, but you do have it in your documents. And this is also available to you um, on our website through a link to Department of Health and Human Services. So please review it, uh, get familiar with categories one and four, not because we're gonna quiz you on it, not because we're gonna ask you to assign your own categories. Um, I might quiz some of you on it, uh, Nicole. But <laughs> just going to pick on you a little bit um but it is important for you to know what these categories mean and what we're talking about when we send you your letters because you will note that these categories are reflected in your approval letters so while you don't have to memorize them it's good to have some familiarity so now let's talk about off-label drugs and devices and research so off-label use occurs when an FDA-approved drug, device, or biologic is utilized outside of its approved label labeling. Again, a drug for epilepsy that you want to use to treat earaches. IRB oversight is only required when the drug or biologic is being used in a clinical investigation. So if this is something that you normally use in a clinical setting for treatment of earaches in your patients, that's totally fine. We are not going to worry about that. However, when you want to start to do research on that treatment and on that care, that's when we become involved. The IRB may require literature to support the use of the drug device or biologic in an off-label manner. So if there's a lot of literature that's been published that you know this use of an epileptic drug is very effective in earaches, then that's something that we would want to see supported in your application if you wish to uh, use that drug in a clinical research setting. And be sure to submit all labeling information with your application. So any sort of drug label that um, is available to you or the pharmacist, you can even go on the FDA website and download the labels 
uh, drugs at FDA.com is a very useful source. And you can just type in the drug name and look for the most recent label and submit that to us. Okay. Even though the drug being used is currently on the market, it's very important to be clear that it's what it's being used for in the research context. So if you are going to use it to treat earaches, let us know that. The consent document must state that the drug is not FDA approved for the disease or condition being studied and it is not appropriate to include wording such as not currently approved or not yet approved. This kind of tells the participant that you will be seeking approval for this use. So when you are putting together your consent documents, and again, we have that beautiful biological um, medical research consent template on our website, please feel free to use that. If you are using an off-label drug for clinical research, please do not include this wording because it is misleading and the IRB will ask you to remove it. So again, uh, to reiterate, standards for clinical care of patients are not the same standards for academic research, and they are not the same standards for FDA-regulated research. So even though you may do something in your regular clinical practice or your research setting, whatever it is, if you are doing educational research, same thing, whatever you do in educational setting does not equal what you would do for that research. So be very clear, what is the standard? What is it that you do in every day? And what do you intend to do for the research? Carly, do you have anything to add to that? No? Okay. Okay, now here comes the fun part. This is actually uh, what I really like. I like the forms and the documents and the letters. So um, if all of you will take out the um, FDA form 1572, the Form 1572 is the investigator agreement. So even though you are not, if you're not conducting clinical research and you don't have this 1572, I know you probably won't, sir, um, but it's actually a really good idea to look at this document and see what the promises are that are made to the FDA because those are the same promises that you're gonna be making to the IRB when you conduct your research. So whatever the FDA wants you to promise to them, we're gonna ask for that same commitment. So if your study is required to undergo FDA review, PIs will be required to complete a form FDA 1572. Some of you are already familiar with this. This is the statement of the investigator. It's an agreement between the PI and the FDA, and the FDA expects the PI to comply with Code of Federal Regulations, have knowledge of clinical investigator regulations, and understanding of those responsibilities. Uh, the IRB also expects that you will have knowledge of regulations and understand your responsibilities as an investigator and as a coordinator. No investigator may participate in investigation until you provide a sponsor or an, the FDA with a completed signed statement of investigator. So what I think is most interesting about this, and again, this is all on your form, this is the reason I give you this form, is on the back what these promises are. And I feel that oftentimes um, investigators will just sign this form and maybe they don't read the back of it, so they don't always understand exactly what those commitments are. So the commitments include to conduct the study or studies in accordance with relevant current protocols and only make changes to the protocol after notifying the sponsor except when necessary to protect the safety, rights, or welfare of subjects, okay? So in other words, it's the same thing that the IRB has been saying, don't make modifications without our prior approval, okay? Don't just go and do things. Personally conduct or supervise the described investigations. This is exactly what we ask you to sign when you complete the HRP 200, the application. This is on there as well. We anticipate and expect that the investigator will conduct or supervise the study as detailed to us in this application. Inform any patients or persons using controls so that drugs are being used for investigational purposes, and I will ensure that the requirements relating to obtaining informed consent in 21 CFR Part 50 and Institutional Review Board requirement and approval 
and 21 CFR 56 are met. What this means is that the investigator is responsible for the IRB. This means that the investigator is responsible to ensure that the IRB is doing its job by reviewing the application on an annual basis, by approving modifications, by monitoring the research. This means you have to work with us so we can do our job. And you are making a promise to the FDA to do that. And a lot of people aren't uh, aware of this. Report to the sponsor adverse experiences that occur in the course of the investigations in accordance with 21 CFR 312. I have read and understand the information in the investigator's brochure, including the potential risks and side effects of the drug. So the investigator needs to know what the risks and side effects of the drug are and ensure that all associates, colleagues, and employees assisting in the conduct of the study are informed about their obligations in meeting the above commitments. So we're going to talk about this a little bit more in good clinical practice this afternoon and what those different commitments are. Agree to maintain adequate and accurate records in accordance with 21 CFR 312 and make those records available for inspection in accordance with 21 CFR 312.68. This means keep track of your documents. Uh, we do not keep track of all of your documents. Everybody calls it, well, I shouldn't say everybody, but quite often we receive calls and they say, I can't fa find the latest copy of my protocol. Do you have it? We don't maintain those. I mean, we keep them in a paper file, but we don't always keep an electronic record of them. So we, if we don't receive it electronically, we don't scan a 500 page protocol in, we actually just say that this is the latest protocol that um, has been approved. So we have a paper copy of it. So it is your responsibility to maintain these records. Ensure that the IRB complies with the requirements of 21 CFR 56. See, you're responsible for us and will be responsible for the initial and continuing review and approval of an investigation. I also agree to promptly report to the IRB all changes in the research activity and all unanticipated problems with involving risk to human subjects or others. So this is our promptly reportable new information form that we have and our policy. Um, it's within five days, so you need to contact the IRB within five business days of your knowledge of an unanticipated event. And comply with all other requirements regarding the obligations of clinical investigators and all other pertinent requirements in 21 CFR Part 312. So again, while this is directly pertaining to an IND and to um, the FDA 1572, even if you are not conducting FDA regulated research, we would expect you to adhere to these commitments for uh, GW minimal risk research, um, any DHHS federally funded research, uh, whether it's NSF, NIH, or unfunded research. Okay. Expectations for study oversight, and this is for the investigator. So you coordinators that are going to go back to your investigators, you say, this is what you're supposed to do. Um, and investigators, pay attention. Delegation of study tasks, st training of study staff, supervision of conduct of the ongoing study, and oversight of third parties involved in the study. So if there are any outside labs that are going to be doing any sort of work for you, um, they need to be appropriately monitored and have oversight of those labs. We had a situation uh, one time where there was a pharmacy that was being used that was actually shut down um, and the pharmacy was mixing drugs for a clinical drug study that we were reviewing here and I see some smiles people remembering this situation um, and that pharmacy got shut down so the investigator reported it to us uh, right away, and I, I won't get into the reasons that they were shut down by the FDA. Um, let's just say that they were unsavory. And so in those situations, that's something that you would need to report to the IRB as soon as you are aware of that situation. So while you don't exactly have oversight over what happens in that pharmacy, it is your responsibility to let us know 
about any occurrences uh, that may affect the risk of the subject. Just to add to that, we have uh, an IRB authorization agreement as well, where if you're working with institutions at another IRB, um, we can either defer to that IRB or that IRB can defer to us. If that other institution is um, going through our IRB and not their own, then please note that when we talk about third parties involved with the study, you as the PI here are also completely responsible for the research that's taking place at those other sites because they are being covered under our FWA, which is our federal lot assurance with the government. And so um, you need to ensure that those uh, investigators at those sites are properly conducting research. That also applies to things like um, community clinics. If you're working with cl community clinics where they're actually the ones that are c conducting the research, um, uh, collecting the data from participants, those types of things, the PI is responsible for those sites as well. So any outside clinics that you're using, um, I know it's very popular in, in D.C. to use clinics such as Unity Healthcare or Whitman Walker, Bread for the City, Mary Center, etc. If they are going to be engaging in research-related activities on your behalf, such as consenting or doing data collection, um, you as the principal investigator are responsible for their conduct by them providing data to you. Um, and by us entering into an IRB authorization agreement with them, that ensures that we are um, covering them and that we and the investigator are providing appropriate oversight for them. Okay. So Form 483 are the warning letters. Um, and this is everyone's favorite part. They like to see where somebody else uh, you know, went wrong or did something wrong. Um, most FDA inspections are routine and for studies that are pending a new drug application review. So the FDA will come in and review your documents. So make sure that you have everything together. Um, however, directed or for cause inspections can be initiated by suspicion of false or fraudulent data. This is data that may be appear unrealistic or if the sponsor alerts the FDA of a serious problem. So if anybody uh, calls in a complaint or some sort of suspect behavior, uh, the FDA may come and audit you. Warning letters are issued only for violations of regulatory significant and significant violations are those violations that may lead to enforcement action if not promptly and adequately corrected. Now the warning letter that you have in front of you, the form 483, um, it's a principal means of communication with the investigators. So what they will do is provide you with a list of violations that they have cited at the uh, review or at the audit. A warning letter is, letter is informal and it's advisory. So if you do not respond to these warning letters within 15 days with corrective actions and preventive actions, the FDA will take further action with you. Um, one of the most... I guess egregious cases of this is uh, Dr. Lane Gentry. And unfortunately, I would have presented this as the case study today, um, but I couldn't find too many of his documents, especially considering that I lost my entire hard drive at home. Um, but Dr. Gentry had a 12 year fight basically with the FDA over two words, deliberate and continuous. And so for 12 years, Dr. Gentry fought the FDA um, and ended up losing and was barred from the FDA from um, doing any further clinical research. But feel free to look him up. But today, we're going to talk about Stephen Boyce. Um, Stephen Boyce is an investigator actually uh, here in D.C., Washington Hospital Center. Uh, some of you are looking at this letter thinking, I know this guy or he seems familiar to me. Yeah, these are public, publicly available. I am not speaking out of turn or anything like that. Actually, Carly, can you uh, get me one of the forms, the 483s? You'll see the warning letter here informs you of objectionable conditions observed during the Food and Drug Administration inspection conducted between August 24th and September 15th, 2011. So you see when he got this letter, September 28th, 2012. So a year later, he got this letter. The FDA doesn't really move at a fast pace. And you, and you thought the IRB was slow. <laughs> so in this, you will see a bunch of violations. Now, 
what I find so interesting about this warning letter is that one issue can lead to several different violations. So one slip up can result in four different citations. So uh, let's just kind of go through this letter together and I think it's really interesting. So number one, the FDA says to Dr. Boyce, you failed to assure that an IRB that complies with the requirements set forth in part 56 was responsible for the initial and continuing review of the approval of the proposed clinical study. So if you do not submit your documents to the IRB for us to review and approve them, you are the ones that are in trouble, not the IRB. Um, if the IRB doesn't review it, doesn't approve it, you're still the ones that are going to get in trouble for it. Um, so it's really important that you keep in contact with the IRB. And if for some reason we don't respond to something that you submitted to us, let's say two weeks ago, and you're saying, wow, I never got the response email or, you know, nobody called me back or nobody sent me any questions or nobody sent me anything about my review, get in touch with us because I guarantee you something has happened. We have not received it uh, because we are usually pretty good about sending you receipt emails, letting you know when we receive something electronically. Um, in the, I don't know how distant future, hopefully we will be getting an e-submission so you will be able to track these yourself. Uh, but for now, if you don't hear back from us, let us know, okay? So give us, a couple of business weeks, you know, just like maybe 10 days or so and let us know what's going on. If it's an emergency and you really need something right away, give us a call. Let us know what's happening. Don't just kind of leave it out there um, and wait for us to not respond to you. Um, so with number one, the citation was issued in response to enrollment of subjects after study expiration in May 19th, 2010. Dr. Boyce failed to obtain continuing review approval from the IRB. The initial response was that Dr. Boyce submitted the paperwork for renewal on April 7th, but did not submit the required documentation stipulated by the IRB during the review process. Consequently, five subjects were enrolled under the expired consent documents. Dr. Boyce maintained that he was not aware of study expiration until August 30th, 2010. We send you 60 day and 30 day notices for your expirations and also your very first notice of expiration is your approval letter. We tell you when the expiration date is. We tell you when the expiration date is when we send you a modification. We tell you when the expiration date is for anything. Um, so we try to make you very aware of this. If your study expires, please do not tell us that you are unaware of this because we try to really enforce the expiration date. Um, if your study expires, too bad. You need to resubmit the whole thing over again, okay? If we've received something and it's during review and your study expires during the review process, you don't have to go through all that. But if you completely fail to submit any documents to us prior to that expiration, um, you will need to submit everything all over again because that study is over. All right, so violation number two, you failed to maintain adequate and accurate case histories that record all observations and other data pertinent to the investigation on each individual administered the investigational drug or employed as a control in the investigation. So these are your source documents. These are records that you must maintain for the duration of the study. This citation also stems from failure to obtain continuing review. Specifically, case histories included sign and dated consent forms, as the consent documents were expired at the time of the enrollment for five subjects, this is a violation of 21 CFR 312, which states in investigators are required to prepare and maintain adequate and accurate case histories, including case report forms and supporting data including, for example, signed and dated consent forms. So you see how one violation leads to another violation. It was discovered during the FDA's inspection that a study coordinator had purchased a custom-made stamp 
and was using the stamp to falsely indicate that the consent documents had received IRB approval. This is not only a violation of federal regulations, it is unethical. So don't go to Staples, okay? Don't get a stamp made, don't go to Staples. Uh, this is a huge no-no. I see everyone looking just shocked. What is really, um, this case is really interesting because as you read through the actual letter, um, and the actual warning letter and not just the synopsis that I've provided here in the case study review, um, you will see that Dr. Boyce um, pretty much throws his coordinators under the bus in this situation and he blames them for everything. So as coordinators, um, please document, document, document. If you see something, say something. Have a CYA file. Make sure that you are keeping everything because you don't want to get in trouble for something that you spoke up about, okay? And um, we have another case study a little bit later on where we're gonna talk about that. So number three, another violation. You failed to ensure that the investigation was conducted according to the investigational plan. So 21 CFR 312.60 states that an investigator is responsible for ensuring that investigation is conducted according to the sign investigator agreement, that 1572 that we just reviewed, the investigational plan and applicable regulations. During the FDA's inspection, nine subject records were reviewed. Out of the nine, seven did not receive study required ECGs at the designated times. In addition, all nine subjects failed to receive designated assessments or assessments were performed prior to the stated time points. It's very important that you maintain accurate records because not only will the FDA come and inspect you, the IRB can actually inspect you at any time, regardless of the type of research you're doing, whether it's greater than minimal risk, minimal risk, even exempt research. We can come and audit your files and look at them and make sure that you are conducting your research in accordance with your application and institutional policies and procedures. And our last violation, you failed to obtain informed consent in accordance with the provisions of 21 CFR Part 50. This violation is cited by the FDA as failure to comply with 21 CFR 50.27, which states that an informed consent shall be documented by the use of a written consent form approved by the IRB and signed and dated by the subject. Dr. Boyce did not comply with the regulation by failure to obtain a dated consent document by one subject and by obtaining consent from five subjects under an expired document. This is also a violation of 21 CFR 312.60, which states that an investigator is responsible for ensuring <clears throat> that an investigation is conducted in accordance with the regulations. So you see how one issue, using expired consent forms, can lead to so many violations. This is why it's very, very important for you to maintain appropriate records and files, okay? I'm not trying to scare you and I'm not trying to be mean. I just wanted to demonstrate to you and I, I really like this case study for this reason because it was one thing, one expired consent document that led to a whole host of issues. Does anybody have any questions about Dr. Boyce and his illustrious career as a clinical investigator? No? All right, so thus concludes case study one of don't be that guy. <clears throat> All right, so the IRB and FDA review and monitoring. This is basically the do's and don'ts of research. So we're going to start out with the don'ts. Again, don't be that guy. The don'ts of research. Don't over-delegate to non-physicians. So if you are a principal investigator and you are the physician in charge or you are the doctor, excuse me, in charge, don't over-delegate to maybe research assistants, undergraduate assistants. Um, don't give them more responsibility than they are prepared for or qualified for. Don't erase white out or obliterate original data entry. 
We have seen this on applications. People will white out the dates of previous year's reviews, you know, white out dates, white out numbers, and just submit the new thing. I know, you're looking at me in disgust, like, why would somebody do that? But it does happen, believe it or not. Um, well, don't white out anything ever. Yeah, <laughs> just, yeah. Let's just pretend that whiteout is not a thing, okay? Whatever you used it for in elementary school to paint your nails or, you know, when you were using a typewriter way back in the day, um, just don't do it. In fact, do they still even make whiteout? I hope not. Um, accept suggested changes. To, don't accept suggested changes to study data without checking the source documents or without justification. So if you need to update data, which has happened from time to time, because you go back and you look at source documents again, and you realize that something you know, was not recorded properly, you can go in and make that change, but don't just accept that change from someone else. Make sure that you are reviewing it yourself, okay? Don't backdate consent forms and signatures. If you forget to date something, don't go back and say that you dated it on September 11th. If you go, oh my gosh, I forgot to date this on September 11th, date it for September 15th. Just put a progress note. Let us know what's going on. Let us know why there were two different dates, okay? Don't forget to obtain IRB approval of consent form revisions. Don't revise the protocol without obtaining a sponsor's written concurrence if you are working with a study sponsor. Don't use staff as subjects in a study not having the conditions under investigation. If there are, maybe there's hospital staff or MFA staff that want to enroll in your research, and they do have that condition, great, enroll them. Maybe they want to enroll as a, as a healthy adult because they have a friend or family member with that condition and they want to help out. That's totally fine, um, but make sure that they are meeting the inclusion and exclusion criteria for all populations being studied within that trial. I'm just gonna add to that. Um, so staff or students as subjects, while well, Courtney explained earlier, they're, they're not considered technically a vulnerable population. There have been um, cases, uh, in particular one institution that comes to mind where an employee was enrolled in a greater than minimum of study and, and ended up dying. Um, and there, they did look and determine that there likely was coercion um, involved in the relationship between that staff and the principal investigator. So I would highly recommend if you're doing a study that's greater than minimal risk um, to, and you want to enroll a staff member, to be very, very cautious of that and the role of that staff member to the, to the principal investigator or to other employees that are um, other staff members or research team members that are listed on that study. Make sure you're documenting properly and um, you may even just want to contact the IRB, you know, just so the IRB is aware and we can make sure that there really is no conflict there because this was uh, a huge, you know, obviously a huge issue um, and, and this happens other places as well and so you know, there was a lot of concern afterwards and now that's why students and employees are looked at potentially vulnerable population because of that relationship that could be deemed coercive. It's so, a worth study, not so much of a concern. But. So if it is a clinical investigation and a staff member or student approaches you and, and wishes to enroll, this is something that you might just want to reach out to us for and, and check with us to make sure that there is no potential of a conflict of interest, um, that you are mitigating any sort of undue burden or, or coercion that um, may be perceived as influential on that person that wishes to enroll. So if it's, you know, let's say my dad wanted to do a, a clinical research trial, you know, somebody might be suspicious if his assistant decided to enroll right away. But, you know, if that assistant did have that disease process or maybe their husband or, or partner had that disease process, then yeah, you know, they might want to enroll and, and maybe they are truly, truly being altruistic in that and not being coerced. So it's always just a good idea to contact the IRB and make sure that we know what's going on and that we don't feel that there's any sort of conflict of interest um, and, and just to kind of cover your bases as well. Um, and finally, don't destroy study records until you have said you were going to destroy those study records. 
Um, for OHARP, the required maintenance of study records is three years after the end of the research. Unless you are dealing with HIPAA, then HIPAA regulated documents, it is six years after the end of the research. For the FDA, if you are working with an IND, it is two years after the uh, drug has been marketed. And children is six years as well? Children is um, until they reach, it's, so it's three years after the, oh. eight, the completion date of right. study or until they reach, reach age 18, whichever is right. longer. If the study's been completed and a child is 12 years old at study completion, you have to maintain those records until they are 18. All right, so those are the don'ts. When you are preparing for an inspection, whether it be through the FDA or through the IRB, or maybe you're just having a monitoring visit, everybody's favorite time, monitor time, um, Section 505K2 of the Food and Drug Administration, or the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act mandates that the FDA shall have access to and copy and verify the required clinical study records. An investigator shall, upon request from any properly authorized officer or employee of the FDA, at reasonable times, permit such officer or employee to have access to and copy and verify any records or reports made by the investigator. Um, I just want to say right here that you give them what they ask for, no more, no less, okay? So they can have access to those records, um, but we strongly encourage you to just provide them uh, what is requested. Okay. You receive notification from the FDA that they were coming to audit you. The first person that you call should be the IRB. And yeah. will come and we will help you prepare and make sure you have your documents and all that. Please, yeah. please. please. Yes, please call us. Don't go this alone. Um, we are here for you and we can help you uh, navigate this investigation or inspection. Yes. Comment yes. Also, um, you should notify your sponsor and all sponsors that you're dealing with at the time because the FDA, after looking at one study, can ask you for any study that you're doing. Mm -hmm. So we've been told by multiple sponsors to always, even if they're not coming to monitor that particular study, yes. to notify all of them. Right. So, so if you do have an investigation uh, by the FDA or an inspection by the FDA, um, and you are working with a, a sponsor, notify all sponsors of all trials that you're uh, familiar with or that you're working with. Right. Yeah. yeah. Good point. Thank you, ma'am. So when you are preparing for an inspection, uh, these are the questions that may be asked. So it's always a good idea to have this information ahead of time. Uh, we've tried to encourage this a little bit with um, everybody's favorite research personnel team roster, HRP 201, that's really what this document kind of does a little bit. It helps be a delegation of authority log, and it helps uh, you recognize who is doing what on that research team. Uh, so we didn't really create that to make your lives miserable. Uh, we created that to help us and to help you. And it's a good thing to keep track of over the life cycle of your research. So delegation of authority, who, where, and where, or who, when, and where. Screening of subjects, who has responsibility for that? When does that take place? Where does it take place? Interpreting screening results and admitting someone into the study. Again, who does that? When is it done? Where is it done? Informed consent of subjects. Who is responsible for consenting subjects? When will consent take place? And where is it going to take place? You don't have to give us specific rooms or you know longitude and latitude, like we don't need any coordinates, but let us know where is it gonna take place? Is it gonna take place at a Starbucks? Is it gonna happen at a private office at the MFA? Is it gonna happen in the surgical suite at a hospital? Is it going to take place at a doctor's visit before surgery? When is this going to happen? Receipt of test article, handling, administration, and return. Who is responsible for that? Where is the test article going to be maintained? When are you going to return it? Did you have a question, Charles? Okay. No, that's fine. 
reporting, um, including safety reporting and transcribing of the data. Um, I used to work in a clinical trial where we had specific scribes that would take source documents and transcribe this data into case report forms and then send off to our data coordinating center. But we need to know that. Who's going to be doing that? When is this going to take place? Any clinical laboratories that are going to be used? What laboratories are there? Do they have specific certifications such as CLIA? And archiving study data. Who is going to be responsible for maintaining that data? So who's going to be the data custodian? When is this going to happen and where are these documents going to be stored? Are they going to be stored in a locked filing cabinet or are you going to send them to Iron Mountain? So this is kind of what we want to know. It's what a sponsor would want to know and it's what an inspector will want to know. So really when you are putting together your protocols and your study design and your IRB application, this is what we are preparing you for to be inspected at any time. But if you already have all that information, this should be easy peasy, right? Should be no big deal. So some risks for non-compliance. These are often cited as violations on the Form 483s. Poor supervision and training of study staff. So if you just have a new staff member or a new team member that's coming in and they're going to start consenting someone, they don't even know what consent document to use and what version you're on or what the risks or benefits are or even what the study's about. This is poor supervision and training. Insufficient investigator involvement of the study conduct. I've been a coordinator. I know how it works. I know that the coordinators are really the muscle behind the research. I know the coordinators work very, very hard to get this research done. However, investigators are fully responsible for any clinical research or any research at all that takes place. So always involve investigators, even if they seem like they're too busy or they don't wanna know, or if you are an investigator, you must take time to know what's going on in your research study. If you are too busy to know what's happening in your research study, then you are too busy to conduct that trial, and maybe it should be handed off to someone else. Inappropriate delegation of study tasks to unqualified persons. If individuals are gonna be consenting, make sure they're appropriately trained. Um, don't have a research assistant who's never done a venipuncture before be responsible for drawing blood. You know, that's something that you need to be trained and checked off on. Maybe this is something that you create is a check off that everybody has to get checked off on a, on a certain task or a certain piece of equipment or something that they're going to be doing. Failure to adequate, that should be adequately, protect study subjects. Again, this is failure to adhere to the protocol and the IRB application. An overworked investigator and study staff, it happens you get really, really busy and things fall between the cracks and maybe you lose documents or maybe you, you know, miss something. We get it. Um, we know how it is. I've, you know, again, I was, I've been a coordinator. I, I know what it's like and I know how busy you can get, but it's really important that you just slow down and walk yourself through these steps because if there is an issue, somebody will catch it, okay? So make sure that any problems that arise before an inspection are taken care of. It's okay if you see something wrong, recognize it and then correct it. I mean, that's great. We all learn from our mistakes and that's what we would actually prefer you do than to hide it, sweep it under the rug, let it fester and then it comes to light during an inspection. So if there is a mistake, let the IRB know you know, let your sponsor know, let your investigator know, so we can remedy that situation before it becomes a larger issue. So our second case study, and you don't have any documents for this, but I just wanted to point this out to you. There's a case study that was presented in the New York Times, <clears throat> and this is a lack of supervision. So Dr. James Holland and Paul Kornack, so Paul Kornack was a study investigator in um, an oncology trial that was being conducted by Dr. James Holland. And Paul Kornack fancied himself an MD. 
Um, so he enrolled in eligible subjects in oncology trials. And this came to light after one of the patients uh, died during this oncology trial. The coordinator altered source records and created fraudulent case report forms to make subjects appear eligible because he wanted to pad the study. He wanted better data. Data manipulation should have been apparent to an attentive physician or an attentive clinician. So Dr. Holland just let Paul go and do whatever he wanted to do and didn't supervise him and just thought that everything was A-OK -okay moving forward. A subject who was ineligible due to poor renal and liver function was enrolled, dosed, and died as a result in his enrollment in this clinical trial. Paul was sentenced to 71 months in prison and debarred from any future involvement in FDA-regulated research. So even though an investigator is responsible for the overall conduct of the study, coordinators can get in trouble too. So it, again, it's really important to maintain your documents. And don't do anything that you feel, as I like to call it, the ick factor. You know, don't, don't do anything that you feel icky about. Dr. Holland was given five years probation and a half a million dollar restitution to defrauded drug companies and was disqualified. Um, so if you're interested in looking at this article and subsequent articles in the New York Times, unfortunately, I, I didn't find any uh, 483s on this. Otherwise, I would have provided them to you um, because I think this came about as a result of this individual passing away and not because of an FDA inspection. Um, please look at the, the New York Times article from 2005. It's actually very interesting. So you have it all in your documents there. So I just wanted to point this out to you that even though, like I said, the investigator is fully responsible, just don't go down with the ship. You know, make sure that you're keeping track of everything. Document, document, document. Because in research, if you don't document, what? It didn't happen, exactly. <laughs> All right, so the do's, now that we've all been like, wah, wah, the do's, yay, do this. Um, selected qualified staff and ensure adequate training and supervision. So ensure staff are not performing tasks they're not qualified to do. Again, as investigators and coordinators, I strongly encourage you to create a checkoff sheet. Maybe there's a little quiz for somebody, um, you know, and they have to pass with, you know, a 90% before they can do that task. Um, ensure oversight of sub-investigators and study staff. Many of you may be listed as sub-investigators on research teams. So if you have staff that are working under you, um, please make sure that they are qualified to perform the tasks that are assigned to them and delegated to them. Address the human factor in systems. Hire experienced, qualified staff. Again, I realize that GW is teeming with a lot of undergrads and grad students that just, you know, they want to get in research and they want to have a job and they want to work in research and further their career. Maybe they're only going to be here for a couple of years. So while they are really good workers and it's great to have them aboard, make sure that they are truly qualified and that they really understand the process. Avoid conflicts of interest and financial incentives. Again, this is why we have the conflict of interest uh, city training for you. Decrease the number of times data are handled. Um, so if you have a source document, make sure that source document goes directly into the case report form. Don't do source document, oh, I'm going to write it on a post-it, but then the post-it gets dirty, and so I'm going to put it on my hand, and then I'm going to you know, put it on the case report form. I went to a GCP training one time where people were writing, um, I heard this story, people were writing source notes on post-its in a lab. And so they were writing all these little, you know, source notes on these post-its and putting data on post-its and these little post-its were all over the lab, but then you didn't really know what was going where and who it was supposed to be for. So the lab director came in and saw this and the immediate response was, this is unacceptable. I don't want to see any more yellow post-its in this office with data written on them. And he put, took all of them down, made them enter them into the case report forms. What do you think happened the next day? He used pink post-its. You're right, Carly. 
pink post-its. That wasn't the point. It doesn't matter what color the post-its are, don't use them. If you write something on your hand, and those of you that are working in a fast-paced clinical setting where a patient is also a research subject and maybe you don't have access right away to something, I used to do this all the time as a nurse. Blood pressure, temperature, you know, respirations, heart rate, and I would put all my vitals down right here. This is your primary source document. As soon as you write data on your hand, that is your primary source document. So what happens when you go somewhere next? You wash your hands, you squeeze your hands. Anybody who's ever tried to get a phone number from a nightclub, you're like, is that a two? I don't know. Make a copy of your hand. That's a secondary source document, but it's still a source document. Copy it, write it down right away or put it on a piece of paper immediately. We all get that it can get really, really busy, but if you decrease the times that data are handled or that data are passed from one source to another, you're going to decrease errors, okay? So assess the ability to comply with protocol visits by the participant, laboratory testing, electronic submission systems for data capture. Those of you that are using REDCap, this is great. We love REDCap. Um, archiving and transmission to the sponsor or archiving your data. Again, where are you gonna keep it? How are you gonna keep it? Maintaining records and drug accountability and inspections by the FDA. So create systems that limit opportunity for errors. So be on the lookout for where you can improve. Simplify the protocol and outcomes assessed. You know, again, it's a think about a want versus a need. What do you wanna know versus what do you really need to know? Be realistic about the amount of data to be collected. Do you need all that data? Do you have time to collect all that data? You know, are you doing a, a dissertation where you only have a limited time to really get your data done, collected, interpreted, and published before you graduate and stop having to give money to GW? You know, so be realistic in the time frame that you have. Are you on a time crunch from a sponsor? Standardized systems and formats wherever possible. Uh, you know, if you can only use one consent document for all study sites, great, we love that. You know, one document to rule them all. Um, use validated instruments and definitions. If you have a special acronym that you use, make sure it matches the acronym that everyone else is using as well. Write down all procedures including SOPs and use checklists. Uh, this is very important. Make sure that everyone is trained on those SOPs and checklists so you're doing everything in a uniform manner. This is something that the IRB has struggled with as well, um, but we are well on our way to um, being standardized. And keep amendments to a minimum and check the case report forms and consents form against each change. This is why we ask for a copy of the tracked changes when you submit documents to us. We want to see what the changes are. It's a really good idea if you have a large protocol or if you have something where you're making multiple changes that you just keep a running tab. Protocol version one to two, here are the changes that were made, two to three, three to four. Um, I find that to be extraordinarily helpful. So you can always go back and you could say, well, we don't need to put this in here. We did that at the last version change. Okay. Develop an integrated framework. So data and safety monitoring plan, data management plan, quality assurance plan, data analysis plan. Make sure that you know what is happening at each stage of the research. Insist on training and then test it. Like I said, you can create little quizzes for people. Think very carefully about unblinding procedures. How are you going to unblind patients? Under what circumstances? Um, who is going to do the unblinding? Is it a designated person? And have a disaster plan. Um, there was a, a flood recently in Ross Hall. It was really, really bad. It was. Um, I, one of the investigators was telling me about the flood that they had to come in at like you know 11 o'clock at night because everything was on its way to being ruined so what's the disaster plan for that um you know dc is at uh, you know sea level we get flooded sometimes didn't the national archives flood 
you know, so they need to have a disaster plan. Um, what's going to happen if there is staff turnover? Um, you know, maybe somebody's going on maternity leave. What is your plan for that? Uh, do beta testing and dry runs. Make sure that everybody knows what's happening. Have somebody pretend to be a patient. Uh, we did this with one of my trials that I was doing um, up in Bethesda. I had to be the patient and I had to test out the EEG equipment and the hood that we were using. So um, I got to be the patient for a day, but they actually timed it, how long it would take to get everything on me. We had to time um, under the hood, count to five, and then uh, come and do the procedures. So these are really important things so you know if there's going to be any hiccups where they're going to take place. Have weekly team meetings and calls. I know this is not always feasible, especially around vacation time, holiday time, um, but try to have something just so everybody's always in the loop and knows what's going on. And audit yourself. Maybe you have somebody from another department come in and audit your documents, make sure that you're doing everything you should be doing. It can be another coordinator or another investigator come in and just review everything and make sure that they're giving you really honest feedback, okay? Don't sugarcoat it because the more open and honest you are with yourself, the better off you're going to be during an inspection. Um, do real-time cleaning of the data. So make sure that you are keeping your data clean as it's being entered into your system. Pay attention to monitoring queries and respond promptly, close any loops. So those of you that do receive monitoring queries, um, you know, if you have them from PPD or, or whoever is coming in to do your monitoring, make sure you're getting those out of the way. If you see um, frequent monitoring issues, make sure that you are tightening up your procedures there. Create audit trails of changes that should make clear what was changed, who changed it, and why. Again, it's always a good idea to have a protocol change list or an amendment list. And evaluate your need for system-wide corrections and training. This is really important if you are the lead site on a multi-center trial um, and you need to make sure that everybody is operating in the same manner. So we really encourage you to focus on the do's of research for a smoother review, study, and monitoring visits, um, especially from the larger scale agencies. Familiarize yourself with regulations and guidance. Again, this is going back to the expedited categories, specifically um, one, four, and five, I think, are the ones that we see most often. But it's a really good idea to just have them handy. You don't have to memorize them. Okay, we're not going to quiz you on them, but just have them there um, available. Know where to find them. Know where to go and find these regulations. Um, if you don't know where to find any guidance documents, you can ask us. The IRB knows a lot of stuff. This is our job. We're kind of reg nerds. So we can know where to find a guidance document and send you a link and say, here you go. Read this. You know, it's really helpful. And then keep that and put it somewhere where everyone has access to it. And this is a partnership. Um, you know, make sure that you are always communicating with the IRB. If you're not sure about something, call us and ask. I think that we are pretty good about being open uh, with you. I don't think anyone's scared to call us, um, but you know, just let us know what's going on. Give us a call. If you have questions, send us an email. Uh, we'd rather you ask than move forward with something with some uncertainty and um, it be disastrous. So I put on here um, some resources for you. So the OHARP regulations, which is where you can find those expedited review categories, all the FDA links, um, so the access data, where to find information on your um, drugs, your devices, your biologics, where to find guidance documents. Um, here's some information for 1572s and FAQ. So if you have an investigator or this is the first time you're completing a 1572, IND guidance documents, and form FDA 483. So if you get bored someday and you just decide that you want to comb through some 483s and you're like, I don't want to do what this person did, you can look them up. And I think they go back 10 years, which is why I couldn't find Dr. Gentry's. But they go up to 2005. Um, you can find drug information and device information on the FDA websites. 
You can find all sorts of information on your drug, which doses are approved, what route of administration, what indications and populations, where to find their labels and revisions, same things for devices. So this is where you find this information because this is where we go to find this information. So uh, feel free to utilize that. So any questions for the IRB staff on regulations, guidance, how to prepare for an inspection, anything that we can answer for you? Regarding the OHRP, um, for the waiver of informed consent, mm -hmm. when you say minimal risk and not adversely affect welfare of subject, mm -hmm. how do we define the welfare of subject? Can it be psychological well-being? Yes. So when we are assessing whether or not to provide a waiver of consent for a minimal risk trial, uh, the IRB will first of all determine whether or not it is feasible to obtain consent. Okay, so we will want to know why you are requesting a waiver of consent. Generally speaking, um, there are very few instances in which a waiver of consent will be provided, and one of those is a large-scale document review or chart review. Um, but if you are engaged directly with research participants, whether it be through an online survey or an in-person survey or interview or a focus group, then we will request that you obtain informed consent. Now, to get to your question about how do we assess the welfare of the subjects, you're absolutely correct. We do look at, is this going to overall impact their lives? So if that data were to be um, lost or discovered by somebody, how would it impact that individual? And one of the, probably one of the most impressive instances of this is the Havasupe tribe of Arizona. So the Havasupe tribe, uh, there was a really large scale government lawsuit involving them where they were being, they had a clinical investigation for diabetes, but as a result of that, it was discovered that many of the Havasupes had a um, predisposition to alcoholism and liver disease. So that data was actually published, which adversely affected their rights and welfare as research participants because they did not consent to have their um, predisposition examined or they did not consent to have those results be used for research purposes. So they did not consent for that portion of the research. So if that it were something that were to come to light, um, as number four there indicates, any sort of information as a result of the research will be provided to the participants, um, then that's something that should have been done by the investigators. Yeah, how you're going to maintain your data, what sort of password protected uh, databases you're going to use. Um, you know, firewalls, things of that nature. And it really, a lot of it speaks to, again, the want versus the need. What do you want to know about, you know, what do you really need to know? Other questions that anyone has for us this morning? No, if not, thank you all very much for coming. We truly appreciate it.